welcome to a new, our first uh, post-Easter um, webcast, and we're doing English wine across the board. And it's a really exciting one to be doing because we've just come from having the first uh, Wine GB Friday and uh, people actually drinking and tasting English wine, not just sparkling wine across the country and quite a few online tastings. I caught two of them. I know there are a few others that have just been trickling through of English non-sparkling wines, which is quite an exciting thing to be seeing more focus on. Um, and we have a team of, of people across the in, board of the industry. And what I'd like to do is to invite each of the, the members of the panel to introduce themselves. I would do it, but I can think that um, uh, I think they're going to do it better for themselves. So I'm going to go from left to right on my screen, whether or not you see this the same way. Simon, Simon Robinson from Hattingley, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Good, good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you're watching from. Um, it's Simon Robinson. Um, I chair Wines of Great Britain uh, and chair Hassingley Valley. And um, we've been in the business now for about 12, 12 13 years. And um, that's about it, really. So where is Hattingley? Hattingley is in Hampshire, uh, about 50 miles southeast of London. Um, and uh, we're sort of one of the top six producers, I would say, in the UK. And we sell, with the slightly unusual element is we sell probably more than most people, certainly as a proportion of sales into export. Thank you, Simon. And for anybody outside the UK, where if I move across a little bit, my X is roughly in the sort of direction of where uh, Hattingley would be in a very rough sense. Um, Dominic Buckwell, um, yes, would you get your next? Across. Yeah, so I am a non-executive director of YNGB. My day job is I'm a commercial lawyer working in international trade. Um, I also happen to be very interested in wine. I am the owner of the world's smallest vineyard, which is not why I'm here, because that's not really a commercial operation. But I am a qualified sommelier. I'm a member of the Circle of Wine Writers, um, and I support YNGB, particularly on the legal and regulation side. So where is your very small vineyard, Dominic? Um, it's in East Sussex, uh, near Lewis. Thank you. And Justin, who is, um, I think, in, in terms of producers, um, I think you're probably produced more than Dominic, I think, but you, you don't have a vineyard. Dom and Justin, you have a background also in um, buying wine and selling it commercially for, for supermarkets. Yeah, so my, my kind of contact with English wine goes back quite a long way. Um, I worked for some years as a winemaker around in different parts of the world. And when I came back to the UK, I got a job at um, Chapel Down and worked there back in 1996, I think. Um, and ever since I've spent 15 years buying wine in supermarkets, I've got a very good exposure to the kind of commercial side of, uh, of selling wine, particularly English wine as well. I've dealt with English wine uh, throughout that, um, that period. Um, I also now make my own wine in the south of France, but we added an English sparkling wine a little while back. I think 2010 was our first vintage. Um, and that was working with a grower's grapes and actually with Tamara at Ridgeview and her team to, um, uh, to help produce uh, one to one and a half thousand bottles a year. So it's pretty tiny. Um, and on an even smaller scale, I have an allotment which has a, vine, a single vine on it. I don't know if you can call it a vineyard. <laughs> I don't want to imagine you've got one or two more than just one, but uh, it'd be nice to, to learn a bit more about that. So you're the one, in a sense, across the board, who's actually had the experience historically of, of buying and selling through supermarkets, and you can look at English wine in, in that sense. And I think you've got some interesting data that we're going to be looking at in terms of production figures that I think everyone would like to uh, chip in on. And Julia, um, unmute you, Julia. Um, you've been involved with the industry for a little while, haven't you? I have for a little while, actually. Yeah, I can tot it back to how old my eldest son is. So that's now 26 years. So I've seen quite a lot of changes during those years. Uh, now I'm part of the central WineGB team. Uh, WineGB, um, for anyone that uh, isn't quite so familiar with it, is uh, Wines of Great Britain, and that's the industry body for the UK wine industry. So that's English and Welsh wines. So can I just, that's, you, you've actually opened the door on a very interesting question, I think, which is that uh, historically we talked about English sparkling wine and English, mm. sorry, sorry, English wine. Um, we didn't used to talk about Welsh wine and we certainly didn't think about wine anywhere else. But we had British wine as this odd historic 
phenomenon made from imported concentrate from Cyprus or wherever mm. uh, that, that, has, that always confused people. And you always have this thing of what is English wine and what is British wine. So as in 2020, where are we between talking about uh, British wine, English wine, Welsh wine? Um, who would like to, anyone would like to answer that? Uh, Robert, do you want to introduce Tamara? I'm sorry, it's very rude. Tamara, my screen, uh, Polly, we're going to edit this bit. <laughs> Sorry, my screen didn't run to the right. Tamara, would you like to introduce yourself from your vineyard from Madrid? Yeah, hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Tamara from uh, Ridgeview Wine Estate. We're based in Sussex. Uh, this is our, actually our 25th anniversary year, which has not fallen at the best of times, as you can imagine. So lots and lots of plans this year have, have to be shelved. We'll be celebrating 26 years, I think, uh, next year. In a, in a bigger and better way. Uh, we just focus on sparkling wines and always have, that's what we started with um, and um, and continue to, to focus on, um, you know, in the, for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, uh, I'm also a member of the Wine GB board uh, along with Dominic and obviously Simon. Uh, I work with the WSTA too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. We're based, I don't I just said, but we're in Sussex, right bang in the border of East and West Sussex. Thank you very much, Dari. Um, sorry, can I just, the, the question really I mean, is the, the confusion that there's always been between English wine and British wine, because we've had this English wine, we've had, as you said, for 26 years, 30 years now, has been a growing phenomenon. We've had Welsh wine coming up, but we've always had this import that has had that, that's gone under the confusing name of British wine. Where do we stand in 2020 between British wine and English wine? Who would like to answer that? So, Sorry. I mean, if Sorry. I can have a go at that, because it's something that I've been looking at on the regulation side. And um, I mean, first of all, what you're referring to there is neither British nor is it wine, no. in that it's made not from fresh must, it's made from concentrated fruit juice and it's not British because it's not from grapes grown in Britain. Um, it's a historical anomaly that goes back to when we joined the EU that there was an industry then that was making this imported fruit concentrate derivative alcoholic product and in today's world it's pretty irrelevant to us and our market. As you know Robert the world of wine has many different market segments to it and what you're referring to is really become somewhat smaller and relevant to, to what we're talking about today, which is English and Welsh wines made from grapes and fresh must from the UK. But will it still exist as a, as a pair of words? I mean, well, the actual words British wine is not a real legal term. It's just a handle that's given to it. It comes under a custom code, um, I think 2210 or 2204. And um, they're not allowed to market it. Uh, in a way that really promotes it being British, because that would basically be misleading and misleading mm. consumers. Which it always has so, been. Um, and my next question is, and I'm going to throw the uh, ball into the, the, the audience as well to get some questions in, but my, my next question, which I think is also a fundamental one, is that my own uh, relationship with English wine began in 1984 with the very first International Wine Challenge. And we had the, the competition in which we had, I think, five English wines against, uh, I think it was 45 or 48 wines from other places. And English wines actually did extraordinarily well. And we were very surprised. And that was at the time. Um, they were all still wines. There were no sparkling wines, I think, that we really knew about in 1984. And if you actually extend between then to today, we've moved from being a small number of still wines to a large number of sparkling wines and a small number of still wines. And I'm interested to know whether that's the, the future of, um, of this country. Are we going to be like Champagne, a place that is all bubbles with a very few eccentric uh, table wines? Or are we going to see more of a, a renaissance now of table wines, still wines coming up alongside the sparkling wines? Um, Tamara, you, you're a sparkling wine producer from the from the get-go. Um, how do you see, do you see that the, the industry being still sparkling driven or do you see there being an opening for still wines as well? I think it's been really interesting seeing how um, 
with the development of the sparkling wine industry in the UK really taking off that actually alongside it has the the still wine industries really picked up too so um i don't think i think i think it's going to to definitely be driven by the sparkling wine um industry because i think that's really where a lot of the investments going on um, and as we all know the time it takes to actually see that then come through into the market is is quite a number of years so i don't think we're anywhere near the peak of um of what's actually been invested in to date for spark sparkling wine but I do think I don't think we're going to see quite the um, the, the lack of still wine or, or a complete reduction of still wine making I think it's still going to be quite a, um, a significant chunk of our production and I always see a lot of new still new sparkling producers are also now planting and train and and, and diversifying into still wines as well so I, yeah I certainly think we're going to be slightly more uh, broader in terms of what we're doing in in the UK um, yes, I'm going to pick up on that because one of the things that because the, 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 our role as a, um, as a platform is the real business of wine, the cash flow element of sparkling wine is one that everybody who makes it is painfully aware of. I'm, aware of. I'm not sure if everybody on the outside is as aware of the time that the wine is actually spending unsold um, becoming sparkling wine. So obviously still wine does have an, have an appeal, doesn't it? Um, absolutely yeah absolutely it helps to 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 turn the cash a lot quicker it doesn't have the years and years of lease aging that certain wines do and i think for quality purposes and for the fact that we are that co you know a very cool climate the lease aging is actually a critical part of 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 the quality of the wines and and, and people are going for that slightly longer lease aging um in the uk right now so um and rightly so so yeah exactly cash flow cash flow in traditional method sparkling wine is is extreme extraordinarily difficult to manage um and, but so, both simon and uh, so hassingly and ridgeview have now um managed to find you know appropriate financing for our inventory which really helps enormously julia would you like to pick up on that sparkling mm. versus still um picture yeah i mean I, I over the last few years looking broadly um at the data that we've got and we don't have a huge amount of data unfortunately that's broken down between sparkling and still but um, we, we know that around about 69, 70% of our production is sparkling. And so therefore that, that's 30, 31% that's still. And that's kind of been pretty much the norm for the last few years. And I don't see that changing just yet. Um, I agree completely with Tamara that, you know, we, we, we're, we're yet to see how the, um, how the sparkling wine is going to continue to develop as a sector. But alongside it, I think we've seen some really interesting developments in still wine. Um, actually some some sparkling wine makers who said they were going all out and just producing sparkling one or two of them have actually uh, been producing a few still wines as well particularly in years where there's been some phenomenally good fruit um, but i think from a cash 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 flow perspective that's helped too but we're actually really starting to see some real confidence with some of the grape varieties that are being planted now and you know i'll name bacchus as a grape variety that a lot, lot of people now are linking with England um, as, a, as one of our sort of classic grapes, if you can call it that. I think it's still early days to be able to say that we can, we should look at going down, say, the New Zealand route with Sauvignon Blanc and, you know, Argentine Malbec. But uh, there's some really interesting developments, and I think that's going to continue. And I, and I'm going to go into Justin in a second, but also we've got that question of a the occasional brilliant Pinot Noir, of which there are in terms of red wines, but pink wines. Yeah. If you're actually growing. Pinot Noir for fizz and back to our cash flow issues and so on, being able to make a quick rosé um, surely has some appeal, doesn't it? I mean, Can I chip in here, Robert? Yes. Um, I was lucky enough to receive about a week ago a bottle of a very fine Pinot Noir rosé from a, a, a certain Hattingley Valley. Um, it's a range called Still. Uh, and I thought it was Imaginative name, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was a great name. It's a beautifully packaged, really, really um, sensationally pretty looking bottle. 14 quid a bottle, I think, which is really pretty reasonable for a very high quality dry Pinot Noir Rosé. Um, and I thought it was spot on. And, and I can see us very quickly uh, selling a large amount of wine in that, say, 12 to 16 pound dry rosé area, because I think we've got the vines in the ground. And with the last couple of harvests, we've got the volume of fruit. There's actually more than we need for the current sparkling wine programme. So I think there's a real opportunity there to make some extremely good rosés um, Chardonnays in the 15 to 20 pound mark and I've even tasted some quite good dry um, red Pinot Noirs that uh, uh, are 
albeit very expensive, but uh, extremely good quality at the 25 to, to, to 40 pound area. So I'm, I'm a big believer that still wine in the UK is going to become n probably not an intentional product, but a byproduct of the sparkling wine uh, boom that's seen so many very professional wineries go into sparkling wine production and then realise that these, some of these grapes can be made into great still wine. Thank you for that. I think Dominic, you actually had a, a comment to make there, didn't you? Yeah, well, I think it's it's interesting that, you know, 70% of the wines produced today are traditional method sparkling, which means 30% are, are others, which are a mixture of still wines. And it's an increasingly important segment. The reasons, as Tamara said, for cash flow, uh, for producers to go into still wine to help um, monetize their investment sooner rather than later. If you look at the, f the figures, I think it's something like your investment would give you the same return if you're selling a £20 bottle of sparkling wine in two to three years' time as it would for a still wine next year at £10 to £12. So you, you can see how you can price your products more affordably if they're bought to market sooner. Um, but you know, the, the mainstay is the traditional method sparkling wine. That's what the industry in England has built its reputation on, but with an increasingly interesting range of other products as well. You've got some natural wines going on. You've got, as they say, rosé production. You've got rosé specialists now and uh, a lot of other things that are emerging. Thank you. Justin, can I come back to you because you we were both at the same conference in which you raised the question of volume of production. And um, we talked to, well, you talked very much about where we are, to, where we've been, where we are today, and where we are heading towards in terms of numbers of bottles to be produced. Um, how do you see that? Well, there's been a, such a boom in planting um, in the last, I mean, the last 10 or 15 years, but it's accelerated in the last three or four years. And a little bit like the way that the, uh, we haven't mentioned the virus yet, but the virus, the, the, um, the deaths happen three weeks after the infections. Um, there's a lag phase in, in the production of sparkling wine. First of all, when you plant a vineyard, it takes three years really to get any form of a crop and five years to get a decent crop. Um, and then it takes uh, at least two years of bottle aging to produce a wine that's marketable and then maybe another, one, another year to sell it. And that gives you a lag phase of six years. And... So therefore the, the volume has been planted. Um, the first time we had a vintage that had really good volume was 2018. 16 and 17 were both affected by frost. So 18 is the first vintage we've actually seen the effect of this large volume of new grapes. And there were even grapes planted in 16, 17, 18, 19 that didn't produce any grapes in 2018. So I think that if we have a good year in three or four years time, we're gonna be over 20 million bottles of, of wine from the UK. Um, which is a lot more than we're currently selling. So my observation really at the conference was let's be a bit careful, let's not plant ahead too quickly, let's slow down the, um, the enthusiasm right now until we can be confident we can build up the market for 15 to 20 million bottles a year of wine that we may be able to make. And I think we can slowly get there, but I think it will take a little time. And having the domestic market absorb all of that volume straight away is quite an ask when we're only selling 27 million bottles of champagne in a, in a typical year, and a lot of those are sold really quite cheaply. So to expect English sparkling wine to fill that entire uh, volume is, is, I think, perhaps a little unrealistic. Um, so my, my um, comments at the conference were really uh, to advise caution in, in further planting and to really ratchet up the attempts to market uh, sparkling wine and other uh, drives to still wines and also to export uh, sparkling wine to as many other countries as we can to, to sort of to take up the slack of the, the volume that we're able to produce now. Simon, you're come the, on, can I, can I come obvious on that, person to come in on that. You've, you've yeah. been very bullish, and you, you you've been talking about forty million being being achievable over the longer term. Haven't you? I was going to say that's a much longer term yes. uh, aspiration. I think um, we've been talking about forty million and by twenty forty. Mm -hmm. You know, that's twenty years away. Um, I don't entirely disagree with uh, with. Uh, Justin, uh, the, yes, there is a there is a uh, a job to be done here. Uh, to be honest, at the moment, <laughs> if I was honest, people are probably more focusing on the effects of the virus uh, and the much shorter term. But having said that, even now, um, we're not going to stand still. Uh, we're already beginning to 
push efforts into export, which I do see as absolutely critical element of uh, wine, the, the British wine strategy, if you like. Um, and also, um, I think the, the, the other thing you've got to remember is we can't rely on getting 20 million bottles every year come, come hell or high water. Uh, as Justin mentioned, 2018 was a big year. It was actually a super big year, if anything. 2019 was a pretty big year. But 2012, we got nothing at all. 2015 and 16 were, and 17 were all pretty ropey years in terms of yield. So it only takes a couple of bad years, and our stock levels don't look really nearly as attractive as, uh, you, as burdensome as you might imagine. So I'm still reasonably confident at the moment. There's a job to do, of course, but we're getting on with it and doing it. I'm going to come back to you in a second, but Julia, I think you want to say a word. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, this may move on to um, further discussion, but um, we certainly haven't saturated the UK market by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we've got some terrific uh, supporters in um, a number of our retailers, um, both Indies and um, significantly um, some of the high street chains as well. But, you know, we haven't yet, I wouldn't say that we're an established category with many, and I think we've still got a long way to go to continue to market within the UK. And as Simon says, you know, we're at the very beginning of export, and actually you've got in front of you Simon and Tamara, who, as Ridgie and Hattingley, are, are right, at, you know, right ahead of the game on that, so they'll be able to expand a bit more about what they're doing on export. I'm going to come back to you, though, Simon, for a second. I think tomorrow you may have something to, to, to offer on this, which is that you mentioned the years where you make very little wine. That raises, obviously, the question of the cost of production of a bottle of English wine across a period of years. So you may say in 2018 we had a, a plethora of wine and it, it kind of makes sense. You could say that if we factor in the bad years, the cost of producing one bottle is actually quite high compared to some other regions making um, traditional method wines. Um, to, to actually, tomorrow, would you like to, to, to answer? Yeah, tomorrow. Do you want to have a go at yeah. that? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Uh, yes, is the answer. Yes, it costs us a lot more <laughs> to make. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, and, and it comes down to yield. Um, and that's what we should be focusing on as an industry is how do we um, work out getting a consistent yield it, it is really difficult because the weather conditions are very changeable and no two seasons are the same. But what we need to be striving for, what we need to be working really hard on is planting in the right places to get the higher yields uh, that we, the highest yields we possibly can, because that is where, if you want, if you're worried about cost, that's the only place at which you're going to be able to drive down costs because it costs the same, regardless, whatever year you're doing it to, take a vineyard through to harvest in 2012 versus 2018. Um, so the cost, you know, you get a slightly more variable cost in picking, etc. in the big years, and you save a bit of harvest on the other years, but the actual costs of, of, of inputs are, are the same. And in fact, in a tricky year like 2012 can be higher. So, um, you know, there is, uh, we are, it is a very, you can't really compare the cost of production in the UK to anywhere similar, not even champagne. Champagne's costs are lower. Um, but when it comes around, are higher. Sorry, when, when it comes around to the retail end of things, um, you, you're in this because of the lag between making the wine and uh, putting it on sale. You can be putting on sale a, a bottle at the same price. And people are saying, well, hang on, we've just had a fantastic year. How come? Well, the answer is it wasn't a fantastic year three years ago. So there's a strong incentive. And I think it's quite interesting. You see this uh, with champagne to a degree, a strong incentive for the sparkling wine producers, I think, to maintain their pricing pretty level from year, year to year. Uh, yes, but you could argue that one way of, of, of actually reducing cost is to not use the sparkling, the, the, the traditional method and to either use a Charmat du close method or indeed to carbonate. And this is something that is happening. Um, and I know it's a, 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 an area that not everybody agrees on, to put it uh, simply. Um, actually, Dominic, can I, can I bring you in? I've got, so I've got a question from Sarah Phillips in a minute about uh, exports, and I'm going to get her in in a second. But Dominic, would you like to address that question of what you think the definition of English sparkling wine, should there be a definition of English sparkling wine uh, in terms of a traditional method, or do you think we should have a broad church on that? 
Well, I, you already have a, a definition because there already is a PDO and a PGI that covers all of England and there's one that covers all of Wales. Um, and so if it's going to be called English sparkling wine or English wine uh, or Welsh or Welsh sparkling wine, it has to conform to the PDO or PGI. Um, when it comes to other forms of sparkling methods, there are already some rules in place under EU law, which will be translated into UK law upon leaving the EU. Only you seem to have frozen. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Robert. Okay, so I think I've just I've just muted my video because my connection was going down. I think it should be better again now. I think, That's, okay. I think we're back. Yeah. Okay. Could I could I make an observation on that question? A more yes. market from one about Charmat and aeration. I think increasingly people are beginning to view the Charmat uh, method of production as another different product, which is probably going to a a attack a different sector of the market. Um, in just the same way that my view has always been people drinking Prosecco is actually very good for us because after a while they'll want to uh, trade up into a, a higher quality wine and hopefully English sparkling will fulfill that. Um, again, Charmat producers will probably be cheaper, but they will be competing more with Prosecco than they probably will be by traditional method. And our sort of overall generic brand strategy that YGB has adopted Julia, do you want to comment on that? Julia? Julia? Yeah, sorry, I was just uh, unmuting myself. Um, uh, yes, I mean, to come back to the Prosecco thing, I mean, the, the great thing about Prosecco, um, a lot of us firmly believe, is that it's encouraging more consumers to drink sparkling wine as the norm, if you like, because it's a good entry-level um, sparkling wine. And uh, as Simon said, I think a lot of people are seeing that they will then trade up into English sparkling wine. But uh, our Charmat method, and we've got one or two aerate, aerated um, sparkling wines from England as well, um, are also starting to fulfil that as well, I think. Um, they're still produced in very small volumes, but it's a great entry level. And it's made from English grapes. And um, that is a, is, a, is a great thing to be able to promote as well. Could I play devil's advocate there? And I'm going to ask um, Justin how he feels about this. My own feeling about Prosecco is that it works very well as a sub £10 inexpensive wine that competes historically with, with where Carver was. It, the, the Prosecco producers do not find it that easy to sell super premium Prosecco because people associate Prosecco with a cheap product. Um, to actually expect the consumer to understand the different ways different English sparkling wines are made and the different prices they might uh, command um, is arguably uh, a challenge. Um, Justin, as a former supermarket retailer, how do you see that? Well, I am uh, concerned that a surplus of grapes will cause a large number of people to produce large volumes of uh, Charmat or carbonated sparkling wine. And while I think the brands who are out there at the moment do a pretty good job and produce nice tasting wine at an appropriate price point, they haven't really impacted the consumer's consciousness yet because they're not really out there yet. And I think more will come. And I think the problem comes when there isn't really a clear differentiation in the consumer's mind between one type of sparkling wine from England that is called English quality sparkling wine or traditional method and another type that is called uh, Charmat method or tank method somewhere on the label but written quite small and it's apparently to them a sparkling wine from England and the main test for me is when you put it on the supermarket shelf or in a shop shelf which section does it go in if it's sitting there on the in the English section there's a big sign above it saying England and there's a little block of English wine some of it's 10 or 12 pounds a bottle 15 pounds a bottle some of it's 25 or 30 pounds a bottle in my view the consumer doesn't really see the difference and um, they will naturally go, gravitate towards buying the cheaper ones and maybe stay there. So I, I, I do see a problem and I think really clear di differentiation by, by name or category of product will help, but um, I still think there's going to be a problem because however clear you make that differentiation, however clear you make that branding, 
people who aren't, you know, they're, they're in very fast mode when they're shopping in supermarkets. Their dwell time's incredibly low. They see something on an end, they see the word England, they pick it up and buy it. They think it's English sparkling wine. They think it's, you know, champagne style. Um, and, you know, they will be surprised and uh, potentially you know, confused if the quality isn't there. Um, and they will, you know, if they like the quality at £12, which they may well, they'll stop spending £25 a bottle on buying traditional method. That's, that's the danger. So I think I'm more concerned about it than some of the other panellists. I've got, uh, I think, uh, ap- of relevance to that, we're, going to, we're talking about export and Sarah Phillips has got a question which I'd like her to ask. Sarah, I'm going to unmute you. Go Hi, ahead. Robert. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, would you like to introduce yourself so the panel knows who you are as well? Yeah, sure. So um, I, obviously I'm from the UK, um, worked and continue to work for LiveX for a number of years. Um, but now I live in Miami, in Florida, and, and I'm teaching classes and, and all sorts of things out here as well. Um, so obviously my interest is in sort of how you all see the export market for English sparkling wine developing um, and where you see the sort of best potential markets as being um, and kind of what the challenges are there. Um, and, you know, just as a, as a point, something I've noticed being in, in Miami is that there's a lot of, I would say, curiosity um, for English sparkling wine. I think there's a lot of people here who want to kind of learn and understand and, and taste it. So um, just an, as an observation. Who's Julia? Would you like to dive in on that? On the education side. Oh, no, so on, no, so on, on exports, on where we're going to export, um, how we're going to handle export, and where to. I think it's really the. Look. Well, I think um, I think it'd be great to bring in Tamara and Simon as well because mm-hmm. they are active exporters, and we're just at the very beginning of um, beginning of this. So the US, not unsurprisingly, is is top of the list. Um, of course, um, exporting as well combines with uh, promoting the wine tourism that we have over here as well, and um, there's a very strong bond with uh, with the US for that as well. Um, Tam, Simon, would you like to talk a little bit about how your exports to the States have been going? Because it's been moving at quite a pace actually recently. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, Tam, go ahead. You go. Go, go. You go, so I'll go after you. I mean, I, I, I think the US is going to be the, the key market uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, it's certainly grown very rapidly. It's a market that, is, as I see it, is very interested in new products in a way that most markets around the world aren't quite so in- interested. Um, the, obviously, there's an affinity, particularly on the East Coast with the UK, um, but right across America, we see a lot of it, and it's been developing pretty rapidly. Um, having said that, uh, I think Japan is a very interesting market. Um, it's taking much longer to get going, but it is growing uh, fairly consistently for us, uh, and I think they will have a, um, it will be a very reliable market uh, over time uh, and, uh, and be a, a big market for English sparkling wine because in the rest of the world, English products are seen as very high quality and in, in for English sparkling wine in general, that is correct. But there are other markets, you know, we export quite a lot to Australia. I don't know whether town, whether town does that. A lot of people export uh, to Scandinavia, although that tends to be, I think, rather smaller volumes. And overall, there are probably, I should think, well, looking at Julia, 20, 25, 30 countries now. There are about, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Tamara. Tam. Yeah, um, my Wi-Fi is a little bit unstable. We'll see how we go. Um, so I agree with Simon um, about the US side of things. I think there's a lot of potential there, and we've, we've been... Um, sort of involved over there. I think with with us, it's the volume um, issue is that we need more volume to um, to be able to, to push into export. So uh, there is a lot, lot of demand out there, but again, we've got uh, quite a strong domestic um, off and on trade business as well, which uh, is again, a lot of demand for it too. So for us, is looking at how we, um, we're building volumes as it is, and then we'll start to focus a bit more on, on some of the more, more export areas. But for us, the US, Scandinavia, Japan, very similar to what Simon was saying, is, is being very, very successful. But again, back to our question, and to, the, to, to repeat the question back on what we're making in style, we've been telling export markets that it is a, a traditional method um, product, really. I think Absolutely. And so yeah. I think that I think there is, 
I'm questioning the, the dangers of confusion in those markets as well. But I'd like to broaden that as well in terms of, and this is something again that came up at the conference today, what is the style of English sparkling wine? We had um, Eric Asimov uh, on a webcast the other evening, and he's a great fan of what we think of as the style of English wine, which tends to be crisper, uh, drier, fresher, all those sort of words, I think, that, that, that it tend to be used. Um, and Josh on Word of the, on, the, on the Grapevine was talking about almost a, a, a pleasantly sour uh, apple character that he referred, referred to as an English wine. I'm not sure if it's a sales uh, line I'd use, but I can see what he was talking about. But the, Cham, the Champenois at the moment are actually making a lot of uh, money out of making off dry wines and quietly pushing that side. And it is something that some English sparkling wine producers are, are doing. Where are we heading? It do, is there a default style of taste of English sparkling wine? Who would like to answer that? I, I, I can take this one actually. I have a sommelier hat to wear and having enjoyed a wide range of uh, English sparkling wines, you're actually seeing now quite a diversity. So the archetypal but you also have a lot So that leads into some questions about, um, it, you know, every one of these that we do, someone asks a question about sustainability. How are you mitigating this, considering this when you have a very heavily export driven uh, marketing plan? You know, what has the past year with climate change activism and now, of course, with COVID brought to issues, um, you know, that you're having to rethink in your strategy? Anyone? I think, I think yeah, can I, can I have a go at that? I mean, I think one of the real strengths of the uh, English and Welsh wine industry is the innovation and the willingness to try things and to really get to the top quality tier. And sustainability is an interesting example that we've, we've formed a group um, to look at sustainability. It's had a lot of take up from YGB members and it's going to be formally launched in the, well, it was going to be in the very near future. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen right now because of this wretched virus. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I always refer to us as, uh, when I do tours around Hattingley, uh, I refer to the UK as being the, the new world in the old world because I think our mental attitudes are very much new world, um, but obviously we're anchored firmly in the old world. So... Julia, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, on the environmental sustainability front, um, as Simon said, there's been an awful lot of hard work going on behind the scenes, um, led by Chris Foss, who latterly was uh, headed up the uh, Wine Studies Department at Plumpton College. Um, but actually, with him, he's, he's had a, um, a fantastic working group made of winemakers, viticulturists, and also retailers who have also, um, you know, played their part in, in, in contributing to how we... Um, roll out a sustainable um, a st sustainability scheme if you like and um, we're going to be uh, kind of announcing a bit more about that um, later this summer hopefully I mean obviously things have been put back because of the current situation um, but uh, we're hoping that a few vineyards are still going to step forward and and uh, achieve full accreditation on the environmental sustainability front um, if you're looking at something broader more on the marketing front that will roll out eventually I think under the same scheme but um, export um, is is certainly one of the key areas for a number of our producers um, and uh, we're only just at the very beginning of it, actually. Um, I did want to say something just that, uh, that Dominic would, that was touching upon as well about the network of sommeliers around the world. The other thing that we've got, I think, in this industry are some fantastic stories. And of course, that's something that really uh, resonates with wine consumers. Um, and being still quite a small industry, you know, we still have an awful lot of stories to tell. And uh, we have the 
um, I suppose the wherewithal to be able to, to continue to innovate and to develop slightly different styles as well. Um, we're still at the very beginning of this whole process. Do you have any statistics on, on how much English sparkling wine is sold in the on-trade versus the off-trade at the moment? At the moment, sadly, we don't. It's something that we're desperately um, keen to, to, to grasp because that's a, a, a good starting point for us. I'd like to invite uh, Tanisha Townsend, who's actually an American sommelier um, based in uh, Paris. I'm not sure if I can actually give her here to speak. She's only she got a problem on her microphone. Uh, Tanisha, can you hear us? Tanisha, are you there? Uh, I may... Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm interested yes. because you're teaching in Paris and you're yes. teaching students, both French and Americans and others. How do you see English sparkling wine or English wine in general um, from, from where you are, both with your American passport, if you like, and your European mainland address? Um, we, we don't, we don't see it that often and we don't really, we aren't able to get it here. I do mention it and people are very surprised that I'm speaking about English wine in general, um, cause they just think of claret and don't think about sparkling wine at all. And it's really hard to talk to a French person beside French wine. So it is a little difficult to bring it into the conversation and for them to really think about it and I don't want to say take it seriously, but for them to think of it as as large of an industry as it is. I think they used to think the same about English food, English cuisine, to be fair. But what about your other students from, from other countries, including the U.S.? In the U.S., they're much more, um, they accept it more because they're just there to learn as much as they can. And so nothing is really surprising to them as far as who makes wine, where wine is coming from. I think the thing that surprised them most is that all 50 states make wine. And so um, most of them don't even know that or understand that. But to hear about English sparkling wine, they're, they're here for that. They, they want to know more about it and taste it. I just can't get my hands on it. So I can't always help them with the tasting part. So that's an interesting, I mean, I see this when I'm talking, I've had a conversation earlier today with my uh, consultancy clients in Moldova who want to move more wine into the UK. And their problem is actually getting distribution here, just having wine in market. And that's true for a lot of places. How do we achieve that in mainland Europe? We, we need to find distributors and how easy is it to find distributors who are going to take an English wine to sell, whether it's in Paris, which as we said earlier, would be difficult, but maybe even Brussels or uh, some of the other countries within Europe that aren't necessarily Holland, and aren't necessarily wine producing countries. How, how are we going to go about that? Tomorrow, well, any, yeah. well, the way we've, I mean, it has been um, uh, opportunist for us um, when we first started. We've, uh, we, were, we were sought out rather than us finding um, distribution from some of the early adopters tends to be Scandinavia, the US and various other places, which came really, I think, on the back of success from awards and, and uh, um, medals, etc. London Wine Fair, I, I think. Tamara, if you can hear me, if you turn your camera off, it may in, help you. Um, coming to, to try to take my camera off, hold on. It, it may help. Uh, Is that better? That could be, yes. Yeah, okay, great. So, yeah, so things like Provine um, and those sorts of things have brought um, the, the, the distribution partners to us a bit a bit easier. But uh, you do, you know, you have to find the right partners and um, they have to get the product and they have to have the access to the customers that you, you want to focus on. And that's, you know, can be hard enough domestically, but... but um, overseas as well you, you tend to be looking at smaller niche distributors rather than large ones you get lost in a huge book of uh, of wine otherwise um, and obviously so you, you've got to trust in the sales teams they have on the ground to sell your wine into the right places and I mean the other question is how as a as a generic are we going to promote globally what what what, what are the means that we have at our disposal uh, financially and technically to, to do it. Polly, uh, this is your very much your area in terms of digital marketing and so on, but I'm interested to hear what, what the industry has to say in terms of that. Julia? Shall, shall I make a comment yes. on that? I think, mm. 
I think the, you put your finger on a very fair question, which is, uh, do we have the finances to promote uh, the generic brand uh, nationally, let alone internationally? Um, and the answer is uh, not at the moment, not really. Um, but that's one of the, I mean, I had a conversation this afternoon on the various developments that we're looking at, which could generate the sort of funding that would allow us to do that. And that's what we've got to look for. That's why I said a few minutes ago that <clears throat> this is a work in progress. We're right at the start of the process, um, but we know we've got to do that. And I've, I'm sure we will overcome this in time. Um, in terms of what the policy is, uh, we would like, uh, and maybe Julia can comment on this as well, we would like the um, brand GB, if you like, to be led by uh, the traditional method sparkling wine, because we think that's the highest quality wines we produce. And um, that's certainly, uh, an awful lot of work has gone into to pushing this forward over the last year or two. Julia, do you want to say a bit more on that? Um, yes, the, 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 first, um, the first thing actually is, um, as an industry, we currently don't get uh, a great deal of financial support to, to, to sustain any generic branding. But the one thing we have, which is, I think, a great strength, which is the collective enthusiasm, if you like, um, of those producers that are um, at the front line. So on the export front, although not great in number, uh, collectively, they actually can shout about the brand as well as their individual brands extremely successfully. And a number of them have been doing that for quite a few years. So for Provine, for example, um, it's, uh, you know, between half a dozen, seven or so producers uh, will um, collectively fund for that um, presence to you know to be made. Um, I will say here actually we do get some funding, um, the individual producers do, from uh, DEFRA and the Food is Great campaign who... Yeah, have... DEFRA being for anyone outside the UK yeah. is UK government isn't it effectively? Absolutely and, and um, the Food is Great campaign is a government um, initiative to promote food and drink overseas so they've actually lent their support financially um, as well as actually online through some digital marketing as well which they're pretty strong in um, to the um, um, collective export um, efforts of those producers. Um, but in how, the States, I know how much? Can I ask how much that would be in, in terms of money? Tom, Simon, it's not a, it's not a massive amount, but it's. I, I think you're talking about the tens of thousands. So my point is, compared to what almost any other region or country in Europe or in the world might have, it's it's not a it's not a large if amount. You're, of, if, Robert, if you're, if you're pleading for the UK government to put some more money our way, we're right behind you, old chap. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of... I've got a question from Karen Jenkins, who should be uh, there. You're unmuted. Karen, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, yeah. And describe, could you like yeah. to introduce yourself as well? Oh, hi. Um, I'm, I'm, I work freelance, but I've worked with a couple of English producers over time. And um, also the background as an, as an importer, I'm just wondering if people are looking to improve their distribution nationally how um, YNGB or, or you're with bigger distribution already would advise uh, smaller producers to manage their, their local versus their sort of national and regional uh, distribution in terms of pricing, structure, message, etc. because that can be quite important. Who would like to pick that up? Anyone? I, I, I'll say a few yes. words. I, mean, I do actually think one of the areas where the UK industry has to up its game significantly is understanding the way that wines are marketed. And that's the reason we've started these seminars uh, and we'll continue to do so. Um, I think a lot of the producers do need uh, some, some advice uh, on how to go about marketing effectively. Um, it's, it's gradually coming through, as I say, you, you don't build Rome in a day and uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And I just wonder, Justin, do you want to comment on what people could do to improve their marketing? Well, there's a lot of things in there. I think Karen's question was quite focused on um, how the, if there's myriad different ways to sell your wine. If you're a smaller producer, what are you best advised to try and do? Because, you know, if your wine was picked up by a national supermarket, that kind of blows out the, the possibility of selling it to lots of small independents who, who wouldn't want the periodic supermarkets 25% off promotional deal to kind of uh, undercut them so therefore they wouldn't be interested 
in uh, in taking your wine if you were if you were listed nationally in a supermarket. Uh, and likewise, do you go for one national? Um, on trades distributor, or do you pick up try, lots of multiple regional ones? Um, I think there's a lot of success to be had by working regionally, but it takes a long time to thread together the expertise and knowledge of of which different people are complementary with each other and don't mind, it, you know, in a region next door to yours, um, selling you know the same range of wines. And and it's it's quite hard to put pull that knowledge together. And I guess Karen, the only answer there is you know talk to the right people. Talk to lots of people. Go, go to you know, go to the the various trade events, which are obviously now all cancelled, and and have a discussion with those people about how much they would expect to sell, um, and you know who they regard as sort of friendly competitors they don't mind sharing business with, and who they really would be upset to see you on the same list as. And there isn't a simple answer for each individual retailer. It's it's about um, uh, you know each each producer has to make their own mind up, work work out where they are. And what's in their best interest for their brand so I, I guess my advice would be first of all if you're a producer understand who you are and what you stand for and understand who you're trying to appeal to and why you're different from the other people out there um, and then you know focus your efforts accordingly and if you need some help talk to someone who you know who might be able to help you and I, also, I also think that um, a lot of producers need to be um, think carefully about how they work with their distributors uh, that's something that we have a bit of a hobby horse about at, at Hattingley. Um, and I think it's, it's something that people need to really focus on. Can I just throw in a, a thought here, and Julie, I, I'd be interested yeah. in your thoughts on this. It seems to me from the outside that the English uh, or the GB wine uh, industry is split into three almost, I think, quite distinct sections. On the one hand, we have the very professional, long-established companies like yours, Tamara, which have, have, have very, if you like, deep roots and, and are very clearly commercial entities. We have the small businesses that are literally farmers who had a field that had asparagus or strawberries or whatever and have given it over to grapes and are, are, are doing it very much. It, it's grown from being a sideline, but it's not necessarily their main focus and they're not necessarily the most professional at doing it but some of them making very nice wines you have a lot of uh what i call big money that's come in with people who've come from outside um even agriculture in this country and have decided to get into making a sparkling sparkling wine particularly in the uk but putting a lot of money into it and i don't always see these three sides these three elements necessarily um gelling together is that an unfair view from me from the outside I think, I think, Robert, I would put it slightly differently, funnily enough. I do think there are um, several different elements, but um, I mean, the big money coming in, I think, has, to a certain extent, was ever thus, and it's been true in, in every uh, emerging wine region that that's tended to happen, particularly in the States and Australia. Um, what I think has changed over the last five to ten years uh, is that farmers who, uh, real professional farmers, particularly fruit growers, who 10 years ago regarded uh, grape growing as somewhere between insane and stupid, um, now recognize it as a perfectly viable, sensible crop to look at. And they're beginning to grow grapes as an alternative to the, you know, particularly apples, cherries, some of the other things that they, they produce. Uh, they, won't, they won't bet the farm on it, but they will produce... You know, significant quantities. So you've got a grower class that developing quite rapidly now, I think. Um, you do have the larger commercial entities like Ridgeview and us and, and quite a few others, of course, Chapel Down. And then you've got a, a number in the middle uh, who are um, making their own wine, selling their own wine, and they're from large to small. I mean, the industry is beginning to look in a, in a microcosm, really pretty much like any other industry of, around the world. But, but I would say that some of those industries in other countries aren't necessarily that healthy. Um, so in terms of, the, again, the, the, and it, you could argue that coming out of the, the crisis we're in at the moment, the strong tend to get stronger and the weak tend to suffer. Uh, and Julia, just before we move on for a second, how easy do you find it in terms of marketing to actually get understanding from all, from all of the segments of the, of the Well, one thing I will say is that there are quite a lot of the smaller producers um, who recognize that the hero brands, the big boys at the top, are doing so much to um, 
to enhance the reputation of the industry just simply because they're better and more widely distributed. They have some great success stories to tell. They do really well in competitions. Um, they are very good spokespeople as well. And um, I think, you know, a number of, of both new entrants and actually some established ones that I've spoken to absolutely recognize the role that they play. So that I'd say is very cohesive. Um, from our, you know, from a, from a generic um, sort of marketing perspective, I mean, ultimately, we want to help people to sell their wines, whatever size they are, um, recognizing that the big boys at the top have got a sales team, but the medium and smaller producers haven't. We have to create the market conditions and encourage the trade to, um, you know, to, 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 to do more with English wines. And uh, that's why in the last sort of six months or so, we've really upped our game on the digital marketing side. So Polly wanted to bring in something there about that. But even on social media, we've seen some, some real growth in, um, in, in the um, number of followers and the interaction that we've now got with people out there. And we see that's a really important part of our, of, our, of our role, really, from a generic point of view, as well as obviously creating some campaigns and opportunities for people of whatever size to, to get involved. Um, but coming back to what Simon said, you know, we, we are starting to roll out a few more seminars because it's a really important part of our job as well to, to to help people find those routes to market and to offer the kind of advice and there's a lot of sharing that still goes on in this industry we're still small enough that um, different producers of different sizes can talk to each other and offer that kind of advice um, I do have a question in the um, okay so this is from an anonymous attendee surely cellar door wine sales and experiences are very important for many of the smaller producers anyone want to well i think um, it's important yeah. for actually producers of all sizes isn't yeah, it yeah i would agree that. yeah i agree okay. Can I, I think just, it's, yeah sorry i think it's really important that um and it's something that i think as wine gb we're really focusing on a bit of a pause at the moment because of the situation but the you know the local and the regional tourism side of of what we do is, is significantly important and that that covers large small uh medium grow you know um, producers totally and I think it's something that yeah the, very much in in the future plans for us all. Can I just tip in Robert and say it's not just the cellar door, the cellar door is the, the opportunity to get uh, a capture a part of that person's brain and, 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 their, and their heart because they've come to see the place and they've seen the sights and, and smelt the smells but it's the ongoing relationship with them you can build after that, it's how you can reach them whatever country they come from to sell them wine on an ongoing basis through direct to consumer internationally or through the agents and, and, and people you work with in those countries. That's that's the really, really vital bit. And I think the, the Casellador has to be much bigger and will be much bigger in the UK. It's a huge opportunity. But the, the way we can really make it work is to follow it through to to follow that consumer through to their home and get them buying um, direct if possible from from here. The funny thing is, we've had questions from Florent beginning to sort of come in sort of right late in the piece, but if we can carry on a bit, I've got another one, another, maybe the same or another anonymous attendee. Do you think there is enough experimentation, innovation with regards to viticulture? There seems to be a lot of replica models across the UK when it comes to clones, rootstocks, vine training, etc. And I'd like to chip in the fact that I, I'm still questioning why we have to be for really as focused as we are on champagne varieties, where even in Francia Corta, they're moving beyond some of those traditional varieties into using others, which give them a, gives them a more unique character. Anybody want to talk about innovation? Mm. Um, Tamara? Yeah, uh, oh, Tamara, uh, after Tamara. <laughs> okay, um, let me just turn my camera off because I've got no Wi-Fi again. Um, I think I think there is innovation. Um, I think it's not spoken about so much um, as it is out there. I, you know, we have to we, we have to have a hero why, and I think it would be uh, foolish of us to uh, suddenly decide right. Okay, well, um, I, I think it's important that we've met now sort of put a sort of a, a stance that we can make really excellent quality sparkling wine using tradition the traditional varieties and, and I don't think and I think we've always had you know you look at most of the large producers they will add in other varietals into their sparkling wines that aren't the three traditional varietals we're not all just doing um, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Ammonia and that's that's been from the very beginning that, that, that's, that you know we've, we've always had 
other other great varieties coming in. I think we've seen lots of innovation on on still wines um, and on um, the rosé wines in particular. So I, I think we are a very innovative. We, we certainly aren't stifling innovation um, in terms of what we're doing. I think there's just uh, how long it takes for that to come to people's, you know, to fruition, as it were, particularly on a on a on a traditional sparkling wine uh, basis. Um, and yes, somebody saying and legally Pinot Blanc has come up from from Karen Jenkins. I just like, but just just to pick up on that point, when I talk to English sparkling wine producers, the conversation tends to focus very much on champagne. We've got champagne grapes. We like champagne soil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm interested to know, with in terms of um, producers, Tamara, Simon, and indeed Dominic, you're looking at the industry as a whole. Um, where, who else are your competitors when you're going into whether it's the US or anywhere in the world, who do you see yourselves competing with when selling English uh, English wine, English sparkling wine in particular? Hmm. I think it differs from, from country to country, actually, to a degree. But in principle, Champagne is the, is the one that I think we see ourselves up against more than anyone else, and each other to a certain extent, but, but much less because uh, we tend to be approaching completely different outlets. Domestically, there's a certain amount of uh, each other. In the UK, I think it's different. I think Prosecco is the one that we uh, would probably see ourselves as, a, as compared to, uh, usually favourably. Would you not say, I mean, English sparkling wine doesn't taste anything like Prosecco. It tastes more like the top end of Trento, the top end of Franciacorta, the top end of, of, of well, even uh, sparkling Burgundy, if you like. Um, I would have yeah. thought the people who like Prosecco are le less likely um, to, to like uh, English sparkling wine than many other um, uh, categories. Uh, we're going to, uh, about three minutes over. Um, Justin, I think, is going to have to run out in a, in a minute. I'm, I also have to give some awards uh, online at some point quite soon. But we can, if, if everyone's happy to do another five minutes, yes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone want to pick up on that, that thought? Yeah, I'll just pick up. I think, you know, we, we, we're competing with people who are prepared to against any uh, category of, of a similar price point to us. We're asking them to spend quite and invest quite a lot of money in terms of buying our, our wine. And um, so the competition really is at that quality end full stop um, of, the, of the market. Obviously, the sparkling, if we're looking at the sparkling category, then we have to be we have to be competing against champagne because that is the quality end of the market or the, or the French quarters or, you know, that, that side of things. But, um, you know, we're, we're asking, um, you know, people to spend a lot of money on, on, on a, on a wine that's relatively unknown, particularly in, in some of the export markets. So that's where we're competing at, at, you know, across the board on, on, on the quality wine area, really. Uh, so we are probably when we're looking at export markets, I'd say we're looking at people who are interested in wine and are interested in spending money in wine. So those are the people that we need to convince those influencers or people who perhaps then sommeliers, etc., who will then share those stories um, and bring other people into the category. Thank you very much, Tamara. We've just got, anyway, you may have seen on your screens, if you can see it, uh, Stephen Skelton, Master of Wine, who's one of the, the pioneers um, of the of the industry, um, just we literally, we've got about two or three minutes literally to go at the end. But Simon, Stephen, would you like to chip in with your thoughts on the future of English sparkling wine, English wine in general? Well, I, I'm sorry, I was playing bridge until that I understand time. That. Ago. Yes, uh, well, I think it's very interesting. I'm, you know, I wish I was 28 again because I think the next 40 years are going to be fantastically interesting for English wine. I think we will create a market. There'll be a there will be, uh, a, you know, a, a problem with the current level of stock, but that will disappear over time. And I think there, the number of people who are getting into it means there's going to be many more inventive ways of, of, of marketing the product, finding the markets. And, you know, when you look at the market for sparkling wine in general in the UK, it's massive. And I, I think the amount we've got will be absorbed. It will take time, though. And do you think the same people across the board, do you think there'll be some moves around of who, who is actually the main players in the industry? Not just main players, but do you think we're going to see new players coming into the industry? It's quite fascinating. In the last 20, 15 years, uh, very, very few, if any, people have gone bankrupt in English wine. It's, it's incredible, considering what it was like before, before mm. sparkling wine. So 
pretty well everybody in the business of sparkling wine is seemingly quite well funded and seemingly quite well in for the long haul. I think it will be consolidation. You know, I suspect that Chapel Down at some stage will either expand or be, be taken over. Um, and I think other, other companies might, you know, there will be some consolidation, which I think will be to the good. Um, because, you know, the, vo the volumes in, in terms of sparkling wines worldwide are still quite small. You know, even the largest are still only selling a small number of bottles, you know. I mean, um, so I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a space for English wine companies with, with more marketing muscle. Thank you for that, Stephen. I, basically, I think it's a very nice, optimistic um, note to finish on. Does anybody else want to chip in a word or two before we, we actually close the doors? I know the debate will continue. Um, well, I just wanted to chip in to say that, obviously, with the pretty awful situation that um, we're all in at the moment, um, the uh, UK wine industry has obviously had to revisit um, a lot of the marketing that it's been doing to promote itself at, let's face it, a pretty seasonal time of the year for us. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, many people will hopefully have taken part in the big English Wine Good Friday, which took place last Friday. And uh, on the back of that, um, and because it was so successful, we've, uh, we're certainly looking at some very healthy looking analytics on social media and the uptake. Uh, we're going to be doing some uh, online tastings um, and uh, events like that over the next few Fridays, which will be good. And we're seeing an awful lot of inventiveness on the part of a lot of our producers to uh, bring people to... Um, to buy some of their wines, even though their cellar doors are closed. So, um, you know, people have been really, um, really focused on how they can um, continue to, you know, develop their sales over the summer when they haven't got their doors open. Well, hopefully, even if it's not the summer, hopefully, hopefully the autumn will be good news, both in terms of the harvest and in terms of, of selling wine. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody for taking part. Thank you for the, the, the participants for watching, the panelists for taking part, and Polly, my partner, for making the tech work and actually filling in when my, uh, my signal went down as well. So I wish you all um, a very good rest of your day, wherever you are. Stay safe and um, see you all very soon. Tomorrow night, we've got a completely different show. We'll talk about that later on, but subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll find out lots of what we're going up. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.